Greg Mullins is a former Commissioner of Fire and Rescue New South Wales. He's been a firefighter for over 50 years and is acknowledged as one of the world's leading authorities on bushfires. Greg completed his Masters of Management at Macquarie University. He is also the author of the book, Firestorm. Hello, Greg Mullins, and welcome to Leading Lights. You've written a book, Firestorm. Why did you need to write that book? I, I wrote the book because during the fire season there were so many myths put out there, mainly by a small number of politicians who I would call climate change deniers. It's getting hotter, drier, windier, we're getting worse fire danger weather, the fire seasons are longer and they come out and say, no, it's just arsonists. No, it's the greenies. They won't allow hazard reduction burning. As I say in my book, I, I dedicate it to my two little grandsons and I'm genuinely fearful for the world that they're going to inherit from us. You started in the fire service with your dad when you were just 12 years old. Tell me about that. Dad, dad was always just heading off to fires. So he would, he'd um, been in the Air Force in World War II when he moved to Terry Hills, knock on the door one night and the local shire councillor said, you're expected to do your bit and you're ex-military, so you're joining the bushfire brigade. And he said, oh, okay. He was 63 years in the local Bush Fire Brigade um, until his death at 93. He, I remember he fought fires till his early 80s. But I was fascinated as a kid watching him head off on this old ex-army blitz wagon truck that did about 25 miles an hour maximum down a hill, um, chug away with about 15, 20 blokes hanging on grimly uh, on the side no seats or oh &S in those days. So when I was 12, October 1971, there was a big fire locally. All the local fire trucks were on the other side of the National Park and it jumped the creek and came towards a friend's place at Duffy's Forest. And Dad said, jump in the car, we've got to go and help Jeff and Jenny. And um, that was my first big fire. I was hooked after that and I fought lots of fires with Dad. And look, he saved my life a few times in the lives of many other people because he was just so good at what he did. What's it like to head into a firestorm? I don't know how many thousands of fires I've been to and you know not just bushfires, high-rise buildings, factories, houses but whenever you're going to a fire you know that there's things will be thrown at you from left field and any one of those extra factors could take your life or the life of the people you're responsible for. So it's it's pretty hair raising, your heart's racing, and any firefighter who tries to tell you, ah, oh, it's nothing, they're not being particularly truthful. So once you're there, you, you can't leave. And you know, I've had fires where we've literally had to fight our way out and try to find burnt ground to get onto where we we're relatively safe because things just changed in a second. Have you ever been in a situation where you thought, oh, we're not gonna get out of this? I remember one in particular, even though the date was 18th of November 1977, it just seared into the brain, but um, a local fire near Narrabeen Lake, and to cut a long story short, I was cut off from the rest of the crew, had fire on both sides of the trail. Um, they had to jump in the truck and drive away because the truck was starting to catch on fire. Um, I had nowhere to go, so I just had to lie down in a bit of a hole in the fire trail and wait for the fire to go across the top of me and I think I blacked out um, because it sucked all the air out of there was nothing to breathe it was super heated it burnt your throat I had burns across the back of my neck um, but I, I live to tell the tale there have been quite a few others where we've been overrun by fires the fires have gone over the top of us we've had to shelter inside vehicles um, and even in building fires, you know, I've had a couple of, well, lots of narrow shaves where buildings have collapsed on top of me. I've been buried, um, nearly fallen out of the window of a high-rise building in North Sydney. Um, it, it just lots and lots of very dangerous situations, but you learn from every one of them. And you were never tempted to say, well, that's it, I've survived that one, I'm hanging up my boots. No, no, it never entered my mind. Um, so, and, that, and that's really interesting looking back because I discovered late in my career that I had um, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I remember the, 
a psychologist saying, well, little wonder. I'd seen so much death and misery um, that my emotions had just shut down and, I, and I'd shut out the intrusive memories. I couldn't shut out the nightmares, unfortunately, but I'd pretended to myself that that was normal. And are you working through all of that now? And, and is your book part of your working through that process? Well, well, interesting question, because writing the book um, put me back with my psychologist <laughs> because I put it all together and in terms of climate change and the impacts. And I knew and I'd been talking about it a lot. I've been in the media a lot. But when I put it all together, it was quite overwhelming. And I've, I felt quite a bit of despair because I can't understand anyone with a brain who reads what's going on and reads the science, it's, it's, it's black and white. It's actually black and white, there's no gray. You were part of a delegation that went to the federal government to tell them that this catastrophe was about to present. Um, what happened when you did that? Oh, well, basically we didn't go and tell them because they refused to meet with us. So the fires were in full fury by December 2019 when they finally deemed it appropriate um, for a couple of ministers to meet with us for 20 minutes, which, um, and us being former fire chiefs from Tasmania, Queensland, Victoria, New South Wales, um, made our way to Canberra and we thought for a one hour meeting and then we were told the day before, oh, the minister's only got 20 minutes. So, um, but it ended up being for an hour, but we wrote to the prime minister and saying, you have no idea what's coming down the track. This is going to be the big year and we need to talk to you about things that can be done. The existing fire chiefs have asked for more funding for aircraft. You've ignored them. Um, you're going to need the military to back up fire services and help in recovery, but the arrangements are convoluted and archaic and just too hard. You need to free them up. And look, there, there are a range of things and we wanted to help the government but we, we used two terrible words, and that's climate change. We knew something very bad was coming. So we wanted to say to the government, you need to listen to the existing fire chiefs, help with the preparation. But the big ticket thing is we must act on emissions. We must join the rest of the world because the temperature is going that way. And as that happens, we get more and more extreme weather, not just bushfire weather, we get heat waves, more droughts, we get more dry lightning storms that, fight fire, uh, that light fires in remote areas we can't get to, more floods because for every one degree of warming we have 7% more water vapour in the atmosphere so rains are more severe when they happen so they overwhelm stormwater infrastructure and we get floods. Um, they, they just wouldn't listen and um, it was a really frustrating time. I think worldwide People are saying, yep, we understand now. We're getting these massive floods in Europe. We're getting bushfires in Siberia, in the Arctic Circle. It's real. So now we move to action. We can't afford to feel despair about climate change because we have to fix it. This is a generation. Um, we've reaped the benefits of fossil fuels and advanced technologies and you know the wealth and everything that it's brought, but it's our, it's our job now to fix it. The bad news is, um, we will get more bad fire seasons and there's warming locked in until 2050, up until 2050 because of emissions already in the atmosphere. Um, there's nothing we can do about that. What happens after that is totally reliant on what we do now. If we rapidly drive down emissions and get to net zero by 2050, temperatures might stabilise and then eventually, eventually, not in my lifetime, come down. And there's one study said by 2040, the weather that drove black summer um, will be average. By 2060, black summer could be a normal bushfire season. But what will stop it being a normal bushfire season is change of state from forest to scrubland to grassland to desert. And that's an active process happening around the world because of warming. I'm going to turn the conversation now to Macquarie University and uh, your time there. Tell me about the course that you did at Macquarie and uh, what made you choose Macquarie? Um, a lot of people said, oh, you know, leadership management is common sense. Well, no, there's a science to it. And I really wanted to learn. And 
I missed out going to uni when I, I came straight out, straight out of school into the fire brigade, but I'd always wanted to do tertiary studies. So um, I looked around, I looked at Macquarie. They had a great offering with a Master of Management, but I didn't have an undergrad degree. However, I'd done a lot of fire engineering studies through the Institution of Fire Engineers and a lot of exams through the fire brigade, a lot of technical learning um, and, and a lot of I've done a lot of leadership courses. Macquarie said, we'll accept you into the graduate diploma as long as you get a credit average. Uh, uh -oh. um, <laughs> but I was able to do that and then did the masters. So it was um, wonderful. I, I just, I lapped it up. It was fantastic. I was working with people from all walks of life, whereas in the emergency services, it's a bit of a bubble. Really enjoyed my studies. So I graduated in 90, oh, I finished the course in 99. Graduated in 2000 and um, my mother went to Macquarie University, my son and daughter both went to Macquarie Uni University, so um, it, it, yeah, it's special. You have retired, but um, you continue to be part of your local firefighting group. Tell me a little bit about that. There's no way in the world, if there were, if there were going to be local fires, um, I wasn't going to be sitting on my fence, watching all the firefighters doing all the hard work. So it's my second family. Um, the emergency services broadly are my second family. And um, I felt, I always feel like I'm making a difference, that it's very, very rewarding. Well, we're very proud of you and thank you very much for your interview today. Thanks very much, Sandra.